Hello everyone and welcome to my KSP 1.1 tutorial. KSP has been updated to Unity 5 which means things will run a lot more smoothly and also we have the ability to add a lot more mods to it before crashing the game. This is currently running without mods though during this tutorial I will introduce some mods one at a time. We'll start with mods that do not affect gameplay uh, just add more visuals like clouds. Gurbin, the planet that we're going to start on, sure does need clouds and then uh, proceed on with more complicated mods after that. But first, let's go through the basics. I'm going to try and keep math to a minimum in this series, and generally use rules of thumb to get around, but still, arithmetic will be necessary at times. Uh, but I'm not going to introduce the equations that a lot of this runs on. The one equation that you will want to know is the what's called the delta v equation, or the rocket equation. It's called the rocket equation, so but uh, we will see how far we can get without such things. So when starting a new game, you have choices, resume saved obviously, and start new, and there are three possibilities, uh, sandbox, science, and career. Uh, there are training and scenario missions, so if we go into training, you can go through basic construction, basic flight, but since I'm going to be uh, trying to get you through all this uh, at my own pace, if you will, I'm not going to just uh, go through these training missions, you can check them out, and see what they offer on your own. And then there are scenarios which help you with specific issues like trying to EVA, which means uh, going out of the vehicle with your Kerbal. Your Kerbal is your little astronaut, if you will, and exiting the vehicle in orbit, and then exiting the vehicle on the surface of another planet, and doing a rover, and these are all things you can do in Curl Space Program. Actually, you can do much, much more than this. <laughs> much more. You can make a submarine if you'd like. So it offers a lot of possibilities. And with the new performance, this is the time to get into Kerbal Space Program or get back into the game if you left it out of frustration because of the lack of performance. Uh, we will see how much better it is. So I'm going to start a new... Uh, I'm going to say I'm going to start a new science mode first, perhaps. If you're just starting Kerbal Space Program, I recommend the science mode. And that will keep the initial parts to a minimum. You will have uh, science to do. You will go out and get science in order to unlock more parts. And so that way you're not uh, inundated with the full list of parts that you will get in Sandbox. In Sandbox, you get all the parts right away. And uh, that might be overwhelming. On the other hand, there is Career, which gives you... Uh, uh, cost to all the parts and your rockets so you're going to have to do contracts in order to make funds that's they're called funds and the, you will spend the funds on upgrading buildings and also paying for your rockets that is of course a lot more complicated if you are the type of person after you do the science mode in which uh, you don't need structure you can just you just want to build freely on your own then you will go on to sandbox mode if you're a type of person that really needs missions and structure to what they're doing, uh, then you will want to go on to career mode, which will give you the missions. Okay? Another thing you can do right here is to pick your flag. And uh, for now, I'm just going to pick Kerbin. So, difficulty options. Allow reverting flights. Uh, I'm going to go into hard mode because uh, I've done that quite a lot anyway. Uh, so what that does is it does not allow me to revert flights, does not allow me to quick load. Uh, quick saving is F5, quick loading is F9. So uh, if at any time you want to save your game, you can. Uh, reverting flights, of course, means going back in time, uh, so that uh, if you've made a mistake, you can correct that. Missing crews respawn, that means that the Kerbals are essentially immortal after a little bit of delay. So I'm turning that off because, uh, in this case, dead is dead for the little astronauts. And then uh, these others are not under normal. They're probably, even uh, under easy, auto-hire crew members isn't activated. You'll see that compared to normal, where the re-entry heating, resource abundance, and science awards are 100%, uh, re-entry heating is still 100% here in hard mode. But resource abundance is half, and science rewards are uh, 60%. So that is what hard mode does to you. Okay, uh, if you were going into career mode, you will have a few more options here. Uh, still the ones that we saw in science mode, 
but now uh, there is a matter of reputation which determines what kind of contracts you get. Since you have to watch out for your funds to pay for your rocket, the starting funds is an issue, right? Uh, so in normal mode, you'll have a little bit more of a starting budget, uh, starting science, starting reputation, and um, yeah, the the rest is uh, probably self-explanatory. Decline penalty is uh, a little bit complicated. Reputation penalty. Uh, decline penalty means if you decline a contract, uh, but I don't know what the three actually signifies, so uh, maybe we should check that out some other time. Anyway, science mode. Uh, difficulty option hard let's start here oh sorry I've already got a default to test things out so we will call this science uh, capital with an exclamation mark hopefully the exclamation mark doesn't mess anything up okay so welcome to Space Center and here you have icons telling you uh, the various locations astronaut complex is where the astronauts live let's take a look at that first so you start out with four astronauts, Kerbonauts, they're Kerbals, so they're Kerbonauts, I guess. Um, Jebediah, Bill, Bob, and Valentina, and you can hire more. Hiring costs funds, but since we don't have funds in science mode, you can just hire them as you like. Uh, obviously, in career mode, you're going to have to watch out for that. And uh, they have three different functions. They are pilots, engineers and scientists. Pilots obviously control the vehicle. Engineers fix things like tires. Uh, yes, your tires can blow up. And scientists uh, can speed up your science and do various sciencey things that we will discover on the road. Now, in the beginning here, the, the space complex is fully upgraded. In career mode, these buildings will not be fully upgraded. They will be uh, really small buildings and that will mean that you are going to need to upgrade them in order to unlock certain functions. That makes things a lot more difficult because those functions are actually really helpful for beginners and why I'm not uh, suggesting that you start in career mode because uh, yeah, you will want to be able to do things that they prevent you from doing. Career mode is much more of a challenge. Okay, flagpole, um, that's so you can choose your flag. Uh, launch pad, I hope that's obvious, but uh, you have to go into the vehicle assembly building in order to build your vehicle. Uh, research and development, so this is the heart of science mode, and you'll have this in career mode as well. Uh, you will need science in order to unlock further technologies, and you can see here, right at the start we get just these parts, okay, very limiting. Then in the next mode, you get, get three parts here, a better engine, a better solid rocket booster, and another fuel tank. Okay, and this is science. You'll probably want to aim for unlocking science modules very early on. And so forth, until you get to really big rockets, very expensive rockets and high-tech engines, and all sorts of these wing surfaces for space shuttles you know, extreme science and the ability to convert ore, which is an in-game resource you can mine from planets and turn it into fuel. So that is the thing you can do. And there's a holding tank for the ore. Lots to do here, but let's just get started. So as the launch pad implied, the first place we should go is the vehicle assembly building. It is the place that we put together our craft, as the name implies. Although we can also put together craft in the space plane hangar. The space plane hangar is more horizontally oriented, whereas the vehicle assembly building is vertically oriented. So for rockets, we will use the vehicle assembly building. For planes, we will use the space plane hangar. Though sometimes you could build a rocket in the space plane hangar and then move it to the vehicle assembly building to see how it looks vertically. The camera in the space plane hangar may be more to your liking. Um, because the camera is oriented differently and moves differently than the one in the vehicle assembly building. Anyway, so this is the vehicle assembly building and we'll take a look at all the tools and numbers. So you will have to get used to some numbers. Kerbal Space Program does not give you an overwhelming amount of information by way of numbers. Uh, it tries to hide a lot of numbers that might otherwise be useful like Delta V in a lot of cases. And uh, so Based on that, you can guess that the numbers they do give you are generally important. And so let's not ignore these numbers. So the mass, 
Obviously, you will want to know your vehicle's mass. You do not have to tally it up all on your own. Uh, if you click down here, uh, there's an engineer report that will tally up the mass for you and also give you the height, width, and length, and also the number of parts. Uh, the higher the number of parts, obviously the lower the performance though. Uh, in version 1.1, you're not going to hit any obvious walls until you get into the many hundreds of parts. So here we have a capsule. Now your Kerbals do not need food, water, and oxygen in the stock game. There are mods for that. There are mods for everything. Uh, there are mods for everything. Uh, so your one Kerbal, which is the crew capacity of this capsule, you do not need to worry about that Kerbal consuming things during his or her flight. There is electric charge. Okay, and electric charge does get consumed by maneuvering, and especially by the reaction wheel. The reaction wheel is a sort of magical device in Curl Space Program. In real life, there are reaction wheels, and they are used to turn things. In Curl Space Program, they are much, 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 much more powerful in the stock game than in real life. And they require the electric charge, and they will turn your craft for you without the use of any rocket. In real life, there is much more reliance on what's called a RCS system, reaction control system, which are tiny little rockets that help you turn your craft. Uh, but for now, we will deal with the reaction wheel. Um, actually, I made for realism. I can turn it off. If you want to turn off your reaction wheel, you can uh, uh, just use it. Do it like this. Pot only. Well, no. I I thought. Oh no. Uh, it's not toggling that. That's an interesting thing that they've added. It's just toggle torque, and then you can disable your react reaction wheel, and we can see what happens there. But uh, maybe we'll do one flight with and one flight without. Okay, uh, so the next flight we will uh, turn off the reaction wheel to make it more realistic. You do not have to do that. Uh, there is a science experiment available, that's important, we need to get science. Mop propellant is for the reaction control system, the RCS system, so we do not use it right now. We don't have any RCS available, they would be under this category here, command and control. You can search for parts, once you get a lot of parts, that will be helpful, but we only have six right now. And so, a parachute. Yes, a parachute might be useful. Um, these numbers, uh, the di diameters are not well. They'll they will be helpful for comparing and estimating how much how many parachutes you need. Uh, the safe deploy speed is very important. You do not want to deploy the parachute until it is safe. Otherwise, the parachute will rip off. Uh, full deployment altitude that tells you when it is going to have its full diameter. Uh, before that, it will have its semi-deployed effective diameter. And the semi-deployed minimum pressure, uh, that you don't really need to worry about because, um, well, you might need to worry about it if you're deploying your parachute on a different planet, but on around Kerbin, you, it should be fine as long as you deploy it under that speed. Okay, so that basically says that. And... Uh, the first thing you will want to do in a career mode to get science is just to take this out to the launch pad. And maybe even take some mystery goo containers. Uh, maybe just one this time. Okay, it looks a little bit odd, but let's just take it out to the launch pad with... Uh... Well, uh, let's, let's give our scientists the first run. Since we're not actually going to be launching this, no engine, right? Uh, let's give our scientists the first run. This will give you a big boost to your program. You could launch something immediately, but uh, you can also have the crew EVA. Okay, now in career mode, you will not be able to EVA in space immediately, but you will still be able to EVA on the ground. So here we go. EVA means extravehicular activities, which means going outside. Okay. So here he is outside, he can plant a flag, take a surface sample, so let's take a surface sample. And you see that recovering the surface sample will give us 5.4 science. The surface is charred and coated with burnt rocket propellants. There are also trace amounts of conspicuous green substance. Ooh, I wonder what that could be. Okay, keep that. And then we can grab, press F, and then use B to board. Okay, then inside, we have the stored data, the one that uh, Bob just picked up, and then we can do a crew report as well. That's the crew's assessment of the situation from the launch pad. We'll keep that. Very good. There's also this goo container that can be observed on the launch pad. Okay, uh, goo doesn't seem to be doing much right now. All right, 1.8 signs for that information. 
and then we can EVA again and perhaps do some more science away from the launch pad. Our Kerbal can walk around using the W, A, S, and D keys. If you hold down shift, left shift, the Kerbal will sprint. And I also want to plant a flag and that's just to serve as a marker for the for the KSC so that I can aim for it uh, with planes and such to land back at the KSC. KSC is the complex, the Kerbal Space Center. So take surface sample. Okay, uh, no it's still a launch pad. Now another thing you can do is EVA report from the launch pad so we can uh, keep that. Maybe I'll, uh, well let's see, let's see if we can take a surface sample as well. You can also take the EVA report from different they're called biomes. So uh, the launch pad is a quote unquote biome, and uh, the space center itself is another quote unquote biome. And you can discover which biomes are out there and you can get additional signs from them. So we have the big flagpole here. I'll put, plant a mini flag here too. Um, since we're not upgrading the complex, it should be fine, it'll remain planted. Hmm. A little bit tilted. Okay, so site name, I'm going to call this Landing Beacon Alpha. And you can uh, type some text for the plaque, but that's that's fine as it is. Okay, how about uh, surface sample from here? Still launch pad. Okay, you know what? I'm not going to waste any time. We've got some science. Let's head back into the capsule. The Kerbals do have a little rocket pack and EVA pack but that's only really effective in space or in low gravity situations you would activate that by pressing R and then you can see the rockets but those rockets are not strong enough to lift the Kerbal off the ground on Kerbin. Oh you can also physical time warp you can hold down alt and then press period to get 4x physical time warp now he's going crazy Yes, so uh, if you need to speed things up while moving, there is also regular time warp, uh, like this, but you can only do that when things are not moving. So you can see that we're time warping by a factor of 5, by a factor of 10, and then you can go up to uh, 100,000 times. So yeah, you can time warp like that, but you can't be uh, accelerating at the same time. I shouldn't say moving. You can be moving, you just can't be accelerating. and of course walking is a state of constant acceleration oh ooh, he wasn't able to grab that okay come on okay so EVA report added let's just recover okay so 9.5 science and our crew is ready for a next assignment now the crews will level up in career mode so you'll start off with uh, Bob Kerman being a very bad scientist and end up being a better and better scientist as he completes missions so that will be very important in career mode but for now it's alright uh, for now you don't have to worry about that and now we will aim to get our Kerbal in flight and we will do that by using our only rocket engine which is a solid fuel booster now there are two kinds of engines there are solid fuel boosters which come with their own fuel inside and you can't add fuel to them and then liquid fuel boosters which are uh, the uh, or liquid fuel engines, you get the engine and then you can add any amount of fuel to it. And the liquid fuel engines, you can shut down. The solid fuel boosters, you cannot shut down. You can see it says engine cannot be shut down. So that's important. Now let's go through the numbers. Uh, crash tolerance, uh, it just if, you, if you're going to land something, just aim for below 6 meters per second in general and you should be alright. Uh, the temperature, that's very important for re-entering, but for a suborbital hop like we're going to do right now, not so important. Uh, but uh, if you're going to be trying to re-enter the atmosphere from orbit, uh, you will want parts at the bottom, which are facing the atmosphere, to have a high temperature resistance. Uh, this is your thrust at sea level, and this is your thrust at vacuum. Uh, the important thing about thrust to note is that your thrust should be more than 10 times your total mass. Here we have our total mass as 2.4 tons. So that means 10 times that is 24. So we have way too much thrust, in fact. We have a lot, lot of thrust. Now what you can do about that is you can thrust limit. 
So here I can set to 50% of my total thrust, which means that that's going to be around 80. That's going to be... Uh, rounding is legal, by the way. Rounding is a good thing to do. Please round. Okay, 80. And this one, let's call that 200. It's about 100. You should generally round down, but this is all right in this case. Um, so let's say 80 is the number at sea level. And that's still... That's good enough for 8 tons. Now you would want some buffer because if you are trying to uh, use 80 kilonewtons to lift up 8 tons, that is going to go very, very slowly at the start and not going to be very efficient. But that is the minimum. Okay, so this engine in total can carry 16 tons off of the ground. Now, the difference between CeeLo and Vacuum, why is there this? Well, uh, different engines will have different performance ratings, and it is based on the pressure at the exit. Uh, you, ideally, you want the pressure at the exit to match the ambient pressure. Now, at sea level, there is a lot of atmospheric pressure, and so you get less performance. In vacuum, there's no atmospheric pressure, or very little pressure involved, and so you get better performance. Um, engines that are suited to sea level have very short nozzles. Engines that are sh uh, suited to vacuum have very long nozzles. And that is because the pressure at the exit of the nozzle of the thrust needs to match the ambient, and so or as close as possible. So that's so you'll get different kinds of engines and they'll be suited for different things. Uh, this is obviously going to be suited for sea level stuff, not so much for vacuum. Um, the engine ISP is its efficiency, and that if you like, uh, that is telling you how much fuel you're going to need to burn for a specific amount of thrust. Uh, you can think of it that way, you can think of it many other ways. It's actually related to how fast the stuff is going out the engine. The faster you're shooting things out the back, the better your ISP is. And uh, obviously, uh, the, for a single unit of fuel, the faster you shoot it out of the back, the faster you're going to push your craft forward. And uh, so we'll get into those details later, but uh, since we only have one engine, we can't really have a point of comparison for how efficient this really is. It's really quite crappy. So um, it is a horrible, horrible efficiency. Now here we can see how much fuel we actually consume per second. So we're going to be consuming 15.8 and we have a total amount of 140. So our fuel is going to be expended in less than 10 seconds, uh, except I have limited the thrust to 50%. So that fuel consumption is now half, and we'll have uh, closer to 20 seconds worth of fuel. That's the benefit of limiting the thrust. Now, that's not the best sort of situation. We're not going to get very far in 20 seconds, less than 20 seconds really. And I could tune that down, but really the, the distance we're going to go is not going to change too much with this tiny little solid rocket booster. Uh, we will need larger engines to get particularly far. A word about our thrust and the mass. Uh, I did say that uh, you wanted at least 10 times the mass of the vehicle. I would also recommend that the most you want is, is 20, uh, 20 times. So if we had 48 kilonewtons, that would normally be the most that I would want. And so I could tune this down more. But I did want to show what happens when you have a very, what's called high thrust to weight ratio, right? Mass, uh, mass times the gravity is weight, and uh, that is your thrust. So thrust to weight ratio is going to be high in this case because we have a lot more thrust than we need. And so what you want is something in between 10 to 20 times your mass. Okay, so all that said, there are a lot of other things I could show you here. I guess we could go through them quickly. I think uh, it'll be good to actually just go through what we have here. Uh, this is the place tool. You can also move things. These have gotten really small since the last version. Uh, for instance, uh, you can click on this parachute and here it will snap to a sort of grid and so you see it's very discreet in how it moves. That's not generally very helpful. You can click here to change that, or you can press C. C will also change that to no snap, and then you can move it more finely. You can move things around as you like. For instance, you may note this little unfortunate gap here. 
and maybe we can fix that by moving this up. This is the root part right now. The first part that you pick is the root part and so it, you can't really shift this around, it'll shift the whole vehicle. You can change the root part using this one and so you will pick the rest of the parts first, so let's say this one and then you'll pick the root part. We'll show that later when it becomes necessary. You can also rotate parts using this gizmo. Uh, I don't think it's particularly helpful to rotate the parts right now. So here we go. That is those tools. And then there's also center of mass. That will become very important for planes. Center of thrust. Hopefully right down the center through the center of mass. Otherwise you're doing something wrong. Or you're being very, very clever. And then there's the center of lift, which uh, I don't think we're getting much lift out of this because uh, no wings. And no no obvious aerodynamic surfaces, we'll say. Down in this corner is your staging, which means that when we actually activate the engine, we'll be pressing spacebar. And right now, spacebar will not only activate the engine, but it will also deploy the parachute. This is obviously not an ideal situation. So let us separate that. And so we press plus, add a new stage, and so now we're going to activate the engine first, and then later, when we press spacebar again, we will activate the parachute, which is the way we want it. Now I'm going to hold shift and click on any part, we'll drag the whole vehicle, and I'm just going to set it to the ground. The game should automatically set you to the ground on the launch pad, but I do that just in case. This over here is the symmetry count, so if you wanted to put many things, oh that's not a very good example, uh, let's use this girder segment. See here, uh, here I'm putting two of them, and then if I press X, I can increase that to 3, 4, 5, uh, 6, 8, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 8 are the symmetry levels that you can access there, and you can change that by clicking that as well. I think that is everything here, except for these are action groups. If you wanted to assign certain things to various numbers, so uh, pressing the number 1 on your keyboard will activate the stuff that happens here. So for instance, if I wanted to press 1 in order to do a crew report, then I could do that. Or if I wanted to press uh, 2 in order to uh, cut the parachute, I can do that. And so now those will be, those will be activated like that. Okay, um, we will see better use of these later on. Let's just launch this. And uh, this time, we will have a pilot, Jebediah Kerman. Okay, here we are. Here's Jeb. Now, one thing you will want to do prior to any flight is to press T. This is SAS, uh, which is the stability system. And SAS, uh, the options you have will improve depending on the level of the pilot. Uh, but the basic one is stability assist and that is good because that will keep you pointed in roughly the same direction that you have set it to. Another thing you'll notice is that your throttle is currently at 50% at the start. I'm using a joystick so I can move the throttle anywhere I like and I start at 100%. It will not matter at all for a solid fuel booster. You cannot throttle a solid, solid fuel booster. Liquid fuel engines you can throttle, you can shut down. Solid fuel boosters you cannot. Okay, so no such luck. That's why we will like to go on to liquid fuel boosters and also the reason why solid fuel boosters have only ever been used on one crewed vehicle in the history of space flight and that crewed vehicle was the space shuttle. And it wasn't used as the main engine. They were, they were on the side helping out to get it off the ground. Anyway, this is the resources, this little uh, fuel tank here. Uh, here is the KSP Pedia. Uh, KSP -dia. Uh, this will give you all sorts of information that you might want to access, uh, including, let's see, uh, stability. These are all very nice. Nicely done. The symmetry thing, you know, the symmetry tool. Uh, advanced, GERS, <laughs> uh, fairings, fairings we will get to. Okay, science, experiments. I wonder if they have uh, the Delta V stuff here. Orbital definitions. Well, this is all very helpful. I will discuss 
pretty much all of it along the way. Here's delta v. Okay, so delta v is uh, something very important. It determines, so if you want to uh, move in a particular direction, you need 200 meters per second, for instance, it's showing here. And then you will continue moving. There is nothing slowing you down in space. So that's good. But they too seem to be avoiding the math, as is typical with Kerbal Space Program. We can do math. Uh, uh, if you want to uh, pop into my Twitch live streams, I can do the math for you. Okay, so here we go. Let's do some science. So here we go. And here is our g-forces. You note that we are close to 4, but not quite there. And we are going to exceed 4 as the fuel runs out. Uh, no, we're not going to exceed 4. It's going to be fine. It's worried about exceeding 4. 4 is a very typical limit for crewed vehicles. So let's do a crew report from up here. Okay, we're going to keep that experiment. Okay. And then if we had wanted to, we could have uh, tilted out in the ocean to get a different reading. And right now I can tilt the pod. This is the magic of the reaction wheel. See, you can uh, tilt it like this, like this. Now we went straight up and we're basically going straight down. But the planet does rotate. So we'll see how close to uh, the KST we get. I should have dumped the mob propellant. Again, the mob propellant is for the RCS system, which we don't have parts for right now. And uh, I keep forgetting to uh, eliminate the mob propellant. Now, our parachute is safe. It'll go red when it's not safe. Let's activate the parachute. Now, if you recall in the VAB, it said don't deploy it when it is past 264 meters per second. So. Yeah, definitely want to deploy it before you get there or after you go below that number. Okay, the parachute has deployed. Takes a little bit of time for it to actually slow us down. Very realistic. And you'll remember that I said you should try and keep your touchdown speed to under 6 meters per second. So we're very borderline here. We can take SAS off now because the parachute is going to orient us. And again, ALT period in order to get some physical time warp. In the atmosphere, you're always accelerating, so you can't do, uh, you can't do the real time warp. Okay, there we are. We are safe. Very borderline. But now you can recover vessel. Or uh, we can see, uh, can we do a different crew report? No, uh, we can only do one crew report at a time. But you can EVA jab here, and from here if you do the crew report, it says you're flying over Kerbin Shores. That's handy. So that's a different crew report. You can board. Okay. We can also, when you EVA, click on this and take the data. And then you can go back into the pod to store the data, and then you can do a different crew report. Okay. So that covers it. Note that we depleted some electric charge because we were using SAS and maneuvering and flipping around a lot. Uh, the more you're going to maneuver, the more the electric charge is going to go away. Okay, we earned another 9.4 science. Jeb is ready for another assignment. At this point, it would be a good idea to go into the Research and Development Center and unlock some parts. Basic rocketry seems like it would be an important thing. Let's research that. And this will give us another probe, uh, not another probe, another science module, and also a decoupler. So that could be good. All right, so now we've got those parts. Now, in career mode, you not only have to spend the science, but you need to uh, research the parts using funds. So again, a little bit more complicated. But uh, for now, we've only got 8.9 science, and the next tier requires a lot more. The next thing we should do is try to get to space. And we're not going to do that with this. The trick with space is uh, you're going to be going pretty darn fast. So you don't want to carry the whole load with you. And that's what the decoupler does for you. The decoupler is going to dump the rest of it so that uh, we don't have to touch down with it. Remember our touchdown speed was over 6 meters per second. 
Let's say we were carrying the entire rock with us and it's gonna be something bigger than this. Well, we're going to crash and we're going to get destroyed. So by having the decoupler we get to dump all this and then we'll just have this capsule that the parachute has to carry. Okay, uh, now the, the thrust of this is 162 kilonewtons at sea level. The thrust of this one is 197 but it's also a little bit more efficient. You can see at sea level, 170. This one's only 140. So we never want to use this again. <laughs> we never want to use the flea again. Um, uh, you'll, you'll also see that its fuel consumption is 15.8 uh, and this one's 15.8, even though this one has more thrust. So you recall me saying that the ISP is basically how much fuel you need to burn. Uh, well, it's... Uh, how much thrust you get per unit fuel you burned. So because the ISP here is higher than the ISP here, for every 15 fuel we burn per second, we get more thrust out of it, right? So here we only got 162 kilonewtons of thrust for burning 15.8 second uh, units of fuel per second. Here we burn 15.8 units of fuel per second, but we got 197 units of thrust. So that is what the ISP is, okay? Although that's one of many things that you could call it. So that's a nice thing, but even nicer is this, the liquid fuel engine, this swivel. This swivel is very nice, in fact. It's expensive, though. You can see that the sawfuel fuel booster costs only 400. The flea costs only 200. This liquid fuel engine doesn't come with its own fuel like the sawfuel fuel booster does, and it costs 1,200. So that's a lot, but we're not in career mode, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but its uh, ISP at sea level is 270, much better than the 170 from that one. And if you add up its two fuels, that's 12, and it gets about the same amount of, well, it gets uh, less thrust, but still, you're using less fuel. Uh, there is this additional thing called gimbal. Gimbal is turning the engine to vector to thrust. And that means instead of using the pod to control the thing, using the reaction wheels and SAS, you can actually turn the engine in order to turn the rocket. That's generally more effective and that's how it's done in real life. Remember I said that in real life the reaction wheels don't do the thing they do in the Kerbal Space Program. They're not that powerful and they wouldn't be able to do it. In real life generally you uh, use rocket thrust in order to control your vehicle and that's what's going on here. So that's going to be really handy. We could turn off the reaction wheel but uh, maybe we should try uh, just this first and in this case I'm going to turn off the reaction wheel and see what happens. Now then we don't have any way of controlling it but one thing we can do is add these fins. These fins will keep us pointed in generally the same direction keep us in the airflow. Now we want more than one of them. Let's put four of them and see what happens. Uh, they seem a bit tilted actually. Hmm. That's interesting. The... Oh, I don't have snap on. Snap. Snap is very important. We want to keep those fins nice and straight, otherwise they'll start uh, spinning. Okay. So this is interesting. Let's see what this does. Let us get our other pilot, Valentina, and see what happens. Now remember, we can't shut this down. Oh, uh, that's an important thing. We should probably limit the thrust again. This has even more thrust. And let's limit it to the realistic amount. So 4.6, uh, we don't want nothing more than 92. So about halfway is fine. It's a heavier booster anyway. We're carrying a lot more fuel. It's gonna uh, expend the fuel in more than 20 seconds. So we'll get we'll get a lot higher. All right, let's see what happens with this. And now I don't have any reaction wheel torque. It's good to experiment in Kerbal Space Program. If you don't know what will happen in a given situation, you might as well try it. Call it a simulation. You can revert if you're in normal mode. Now I can't revert in here. I didn't dump the mod propellant there. All right, let's go. Okay, nice healthy thrust. You can see it's uh, closer to 2 now because that's the number I used. I used uh, 20 instead of having something more than that, so we'll be ending up closer to 2 G's. 2 G's is about the upper limit for me, personally. Now here we're through the transonic region and we're going supersonic. 
Supersonics around 303 to 343 meters per second depending on your altitude. Um, that will become very important to avoid your rockets flipping. You will uh, encounter a lot more drag during that period and that drag will likely flip your rocket if you're not careful. So now we're experiencing very high g-forces. Okay, and we're going past a thousand meters per second or about Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. Okay, Valentina is now going to 28 kilometers. Let's see how high Valentina is going to get. We can see that from here. And you see this apoapsis. This apoapsis is the peak of our current trajectory. This is our current trajectory. And the peak says 79 kilometers. That's excellent because uh, 70 kilometers is space. So Valentina is going to go to space. And then we can do a little report from space. Uh, I don't want to do the crew report right now because this is not space. Though we would get, uh, well we can see, this, uh, the upper atmosphere. But I want to get the space report. So we'll hold on on that. You'll see as we go up uh, we are losing velocity. Obviously the gravity is still trying to pull us down. Surface velocity does not include the rotation of the planet. Orbital velocity does. So uh, you're going to be... Uh, there's a horizontal velocity that uh, we automatically get from the planet rotating. That's helpful. Uh, that means it takes us less to get into orbit thanks to that horizontal velocity that the rotation gives us. So crew report. Crew report in space near Kerbin. Let's keep that data. Now we can transmit that data if we had a transmitter. But while we're in space, I, I want her to EVA. Now in, in uh, career mode, you won't be able to do this yet until you unlock the building. Uh, you'll need to unlock a particular building in order to be able to have them pop out like this. But I don't need to do that. So I can just have her board again. Make sure that you can board the Kerbal again. Uh, if you are uh, heading down in re-entry, you might have a little bit of difficulty. Now, we don't have any, any way to turn this, right? Our reaction wheel is disabled. Now, let me show you. Uh, right now, I've set retrograde reaction wheel disabled. If I enable retro, oh, now it now it automatically. So okay, uh, let let's let's say I was off. Oh, I, oh, no no reaction wheels is still running. Let's say I was uh, badly off. Hmm, hold on, I want to turn it away from the target. Yeah, like that. Okay, let's say it was like, okay, right, and then just hold it there. Okay, now. Disable the reaction wheel. Okay, let's see what happens. I'm going to dump the rocket booster now. In theory, the capsule is supposed to orient itself. We will see if that happens. If it doesn't, I'll quickly re-enable the reaction wheel and get it to the right position. But here we have entered the atmosphere again. Will the capsule orient itself to avoid oblivion? The way it does that is that this portion should be heavier than what's up there, right? I mean, this is... And you can see it's turning. Is it turning the right way? Yeah. Okay, very good. So it's automatically... Well, it'll wiggle around a bit. Now the planet's rotated a bit. So remember how you saw the trajectory? It seemed like we were going to land in the water. But the planet's rotated a bit, so we're going to actually land inland. So we'll take a surface sample once we get there. We're not going to have too much time to deploy the parachute, as you see. We're slowing down. Well, the parachute looks good. Okay. Parachute deployment. Come on, slow down, slow down, slow down. Okay. And without the little booster, we are safely below 6 meters per second, so that's nice. So there you go. And that's more like how real rockets... Oh, there's... The, that's, that, was the, that was the booster there. That's more like how regular capsules do it. They don't use reaction wheels to orient, but if you want to use the reaction wheel, that's fine. But uh, there are mods that will uh, eliminate the reaction wheels and create more realism, realism overhaul. We'll do that so that uh, you don't have these overpowered things. But it can be fun to take advantage of the overpowered reaction wheels 
There's many hijinks that you can do as a result. Plop. Okay, so now Valentina's on the surface, and we are in a different biome, so let's, uh, let's EVA. Let's get an EVA report. Uh, I think we already got this one, actually. No, that was Kerbin Shores. Let's uh, take the data. Okay, let's uh, board. Let us get a crew report from here. Keep. EVA again. Hop off. Get a surface sample. Okay, looks like dirt. Very perceptive. EVA report from the ground. Remember, the other one is flying, I think. Okay, climb. Board. Okay, and that's that. Let's uh, recover vessel. There are many ways to do this science much more quickly, but I'm trying to go over all the concepts. So uh, here we got 23.7 uh, science, very good. And Valentina's ready. Let's see what that can get us. It could get us uh, the Reliant engine. That does not gimbal, so that doesn't turn around. So you can't use that for maneuvering, but it gives you better sea level ISP and more thrust than the, than the one that does gimbal, which is this, uh, whoops which is this swivel engine, appropriately named. Nose cones might be nice, radial decouplers might be nice. Um, heat shields, if we're going to go to orbit, we really need the heat shield. And that's because coming back down will generate a lot more heat than we've seen so far. So maybe that's the thing that we want. Yeah, I, I would tend to uh, aim for the heat shield. Okay, so we've got the heat shield. Now, can we make a vehicle to get to orbit? Orbit and space are not the same thing. Okay, let's go to the tracking station here. This is the first time we're in the tracking station. Uh, space, getting to space was that hop that you just saw. Getting into orbit is going around the planet. And just visually, you can see that that little hop that we just made, getting into space, is somewhat trivial compared to actually making orbit and staying in space around the planet. That takes a lot more energy. Uh, the next goal would be to try to get to the moon or Minmus. And then after we get to the moon or Minmus, we could aim for some of the other planets in the, the Kerbal system. Now, you, you might wonder, well, is there some way that we can turn the Kerbal system into the real solar system? And yes, there is. There are mods for that. Uh, there are mods for everything. So, yes, you can turn Elu into Pluto, and you can have all of the things uh, the way the real solar system has it. But if you're just starting out, it might be helpful to practice around Kerbin because it's much more forgiving. Uh, orbital velocity around Earth, for instance, is more than three times the orbital velocity around Kerbin, so you're going to need uh, proportional, well, actually quite a lot more fuel. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot quicker also to do things in the stock system. And the more you do it, the more practice you get, the more prepared you'll be for the more difficult things. Okay, so our next job is to get to orbit. And we're not going to do that with just one stage. What we need is multiple stages. There is a practical limit to how much velocity you're going to get out of a single stage. And that practical limit is related to its ISP. If you'd like to think of it, um, uh, to, for a rough approximation, uh, to get into orbit around Kerbin, just estimate 4,000 meters per second. Uh, that's how much, how much delta V, I've uh, used that term, I haven't explained it, I know. But how much delta V, it's a change in velocity, how much total... Uh, how much total velocity change you can do. You can call it change in situation, you can call it a whole, whole bunch of things. Um, you can define it in any way you like. I'm just gonna say delta V. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to try and explain delta V in any particular way except to say it's uh, the way we, what we do in order to figure out if we can get to where we're going. That's it. Now, that, that's gonna be my definition of delta V. Delta V is how we figure out if we can get to where we're going. To get to orbit around Kerbin, you need 4,000 meters per second of delta V. Uh, to transfer from Kerbin orbit to the moon, you need about 850 with a little buffer. Uh, to get into orbit around the moon after that, you need around 250. 
and so so on and so forth. The requirements to do anything in Kerbal Space Program or anything in real life uh, are pretty definite when it comes to Delta V. There is a minimum Delta V to do anything. For instance, to transfer to the moon from Earth orbit, you will need about 3,100 to 3,200 meters per second. Uh, to get into Earth orbit, you need around 9,000 to 9,500. And so these numbers are all known. And so the delta V is how you figure out what are you have enough to do what you want to do. And the practical limit, limit for a booster like this is simply 10 times the, the what you call it, the ISP. So I would expect, um, if I had the proper amount of fuel, I would expect to get 1,700 and I would stage properly, etc, etc, etc. It, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, for instance, especially if you have strap-on boosters, which means if you have boosters on the side like this, well, that's going to do something different. Let's say we've got a rocket like this. How much does that weigh? 4.7 tons. So I want, I really want about uh, 50 kilonewtons or something like that. This one's uh, 168 kilonewtons. That's more than three times what I need. So I'm going to tune this down to a third. I'm just estimating. I'm not doing, I mean, I could calculate it out exactly and all that, but uh, a rough approximation is adequate. Um, this will give us plenty of thrust. Then we can add another decoupler. And then we can add more fuel tanks. And more fuel. Uh, actually, one thing you can do is, you see here, this will select all four of these. You can hold Shift, oh no, sorry, Alt, and get a copy. So hold Alt to get a copy. Now the practical limit for this engine is uh, 16 tons. Okay, we can add more fuel. Now you'll note that our rocket is getting a little bit tall. And that's going to be a recipe for flipping out. Now we do have the gimbal from that engine, so that's nice. But maybe instead of having this arrangement, well, Maybe we'll just take the extra thrust. Oh, who knows, this could work. Again, the the part where it flips is generally that, that part in, uh, in around where we break the speed of sound. That's where it will flip. Now, we don't have a radio decoupler. I haven't unlocked that yet. So, I guess we won't be able to use this guy. Okay, now, about staging. Uh, the ratio between your stages should be about like 5 to 10. Uh, generally in Kerbal Space Program it's closer to 5. It could be as low as 3. So the thrust of this engine compared to the thrust of that engine, 3 to 5 was where you want to be. And then you can figure out the fuel from that, right? So if the ratio between the thrust is 3 to 5, then you can assume that you have 3 to 5 times more, well, uh, I should say two to four times more fuel because we have to add the fuel that's up here as well, uh, down here than up there. And indeed, one, two, three, four times more fuel than is up there. So our ratio is pretty good. Actually, we have a little bit more thrust up here than we strictly need. Let's see what happens with this one. It's not going to get off the ground very quickly. Maybe, maybe we should improve our ratio instead of having four closer to three which is the ratio between the thrusts. Right now, the thrust on this engine is three times less than the thrust of this engine. So, yeah, we'll keep the ratios like that. So, um, I mean, it should make sense. If you have less thrust here, you can push less fuel around. And then there's the payload as well. If you got a really heavy payload, it changes things a lot. But in this case, this rocket is mostly fuel. Most of your rockets are going to be mostly fuel. Now, I don't know if this is going to stand up very well on the launch pad or if it's going to try and tip over. So we will want to ignite as quickly as possible. I think uh, Valentina was the first to get into space. Jeb will be the first to try and get to orbit. We could put other science on here, by the way. We haven't done much of that yet. Ooh, remember when I, I said that for orbit, we really want heat shield. So let's put a heat shield in. That'll make things a little bit safer. Okay, let's try this. I don't know what's going to happen either. Um, I would have to do the math, but I'm deliberately not doing the math. I could calculate this out for you. The way you do the math is 
the you can calculate the delta v like i said you need four thousand of it and the way you do the math is you calculate how much it all weighs without the fuel and then how much it weighs with the fuel and there is an equation that relates that and the ISP to how much delta V you have. The delta V is equal to 9.81 times the ISP times the natural logarithm of the craft with the fuel and then the stage without the fuel and then you add the stages together. If that's too complicated don't worry about it let's just try it. In Kerbal Space Program, the luxury that you have is that you can just go ahead and try it. And then if you want to, if you're in normal mode, revert the flight if it doesn't work out. And then you'll figure out if you need to add more fuel or not. And then you get a feel for the whole thing. Uh, then you can just uh, feel your way through whether you need more fuel in your stages or not. And then you can get the sort of rules of thumb that I'm going to try and offer, like the ratio between the stages. Uh, in Kerbal Space Program, 3 to 5 is okay. Uh, in real life, you'll see 5 to 10, unless they have uh, side boosters. If they have side boosters, the ratio can be quite different. Okay, here we go. Very slow and steady liftoff this time. I don't know, as our capsule... Our reaction wheel is still disabled. I, uh, I'm i going to keep it like that. I'm going to keep it like that. Call it realism. We are going to go straight up. Now, the trick with orbit is you don't go straight up and straight down, right? Uh, if we are going to try and go around the planet, you can see that it'll be really helpful to start going sideways at some point. Otherwise, we just got to keep going up and then down, unless we reach escape velocity, in which case we go up and then not come back down. But we need to go sideways, like right now. Right now will be... Um, now, it's, 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 it's not really happy with this this whole sideways thing. And you can see it's shaking a bit. This is what I was worried about when it comes to the the tallness of it. And we're not through the speed of sound yet. That's when it's gonna get really iffy. You'll note I'm really hugging this marker here. That's our velocity marker. That's uh, basically rockets stand on a pillar of fire. And if that's the direction of the pillow, pillar of fire right now. You do not want to move too far away from that pillar of fire. We are now through the transonic region, so I'm going to throttle down so I can turn more. So that we can go more horizontal rather than vertical. But I still don't want to turn too far away from the pillar of fire because the atmosphere will then push on me. Right now I'm uh, sort of cutting through the atmosphere in a very sleek way. But if I turn away from that, that velocity marker, which is our current thrust, uh, the we're going to be presenting more of a side to the atmosphere and then the atmosphere will push on us a lot more. Right now the atmosphere is just pushing on our little cone on the front. Uh, if I tilt like that it'll be pushing more on the side and then it'll flip us over. Okay, I'm going to throttle up step and we have an orbital marker so let's follow that. Now I've ray tuned this engine down, so that's why even at full thrust it sounds like it doesn't, uh, it isn't going very far. You can still tune it up again if you want to go fast again. You can thrust, uh, change the thrust limiter, and go back up to full thrust. But I don't need to do that. Now it is critically important that if you get a Kerbal into orbit, you have enough fuel to get that Kerbal back down. <laughs> Uh, now orbit, remember your minimum height has to be 70 kilometers and so here we have passed 70 kilometers so it's good. And we are going horizontal now to try and get speed like this. Your target velocity for orbit is 2300 meters per second. So we're about halfway now. Now we've used more than half of our fuel but you get more and more bang for your buck with the last bit of fuel. So we'll see how close we are. We should be pretty close. And the reason you get more bang for your buck with the last bit of fuel is because the whole craft is lighter. The craft is getting lighter and lighter and lighter, so you get uh, more of a benefit from every little bit of fuel. I have not calculated this out previously, so we might be short of orbit this time. And I think we will be. Okay, we are short of orbit. So we're going like this. That's not the best thing to do. Um, obviously, orbit would be nice. 
but we'll try it out. Jeb, uh, Jeb can still get uh, crew report. It's uh, it's not worth anything though. When you've already done a science experiment, it's not worth anything. Jeb could EVA, and in this case, the EVA report is over the water, which is different from what we've done before, so we can keep it, and he can board. So that's the biome dependency. So crew report, not biome dependent. The EVA report is. We've done grasslands before, but not water. There's also other biomes that you will discover, mountains and stuff like that. So you can always uh, have the Kerbal pop out and then try it. Now we might as well dump the stage there because it's not going to do us any good. So set. And again, the capsule should orient properly. So if it doesn't, I'll turn on the reaction wheels again. But uh, right now the reaction wheels are still disabled. I think we're still over water, so we're not going to get any science benefit from having the Kerbal pop out again. Okay, here we go. We are coming in quite fast. And the pod is now turning on its own because of the way the mass is on the pod. I know it's dark. There are mods for making it brighter in the nighttime side, but I don't have those installed right now, so I'll just aim for the Milky Way sort of thing. SAS technically isn't doing anything right now. I could turn it off and the craft will behave in exactly the same way. Again, the SAS key is T. Now the question is, will we survive the heat? Right? And also, will we have time to deploy the parachute? It was pretty darn close on the suborbital flight, the one that was just into space with Valentina. You'll note our ablator, the heat shield has something called ablator on it, and that peels away. That's meant to peel away in order to uh, keep the craft cool, and that is peeling away right now, so you have a limited amount of that stuff. That was the spent stage that just exploded. We are slowing down very quickly, slowing down very quickly, decelerating decelerating rapidly uh, anyway something like that 5 G's now we did not use much ablators so for future reference maybe we should have less of that we can tweak that we can tweak that in the VAB in the vehicle assembly building and so you may want to do that that will save you some mass the ablator takes mass and so getting rid of it will save you some mass it looks like Jeb is going to be alright that was not a given. That 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 was uh, that could have been bad, but it looks like Jeb is going to be all right. Um, it looks like our parachute is safe. We are below 260, so yes, parachute deployment. Looks like it's grasslands again. So nothing new here. It would have been better if we splashed down in the water. We could have gotten the surface sample from the water, and that would have been more science. So we failed getting into orbit this time, but uh, perhaps I'll save that for next time. So next time in the next video, I will start out by trying to get into orbit again with more power, more engines, maybe some boosters, that sort of thing. And I will continue to talk about what we need to know in order to do things. But anyway, successful rocket design, you can sort of see the basics and get started on it. And uh, yep, we will see where we can go from here to other planets and and all sorts of craziness okay and recover and 5.6 science and on that note I'll say thank you for watching if you enjoyed this video please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time